today on Live Your Faith. Anything God calls, any assignment God ever gives it, anyone, an anointing comes with it. That anointing has in it power. It has in it mighty works. It has in it abilities that are beyond what you can do. We're ministering this morning on the anointing. Praise God. Acts chapter 10, let's read verse 38. Very familiar verse of scripture to us here at Word of Faith. It reads, how God anointed. Everyone say anointed. anointed. Say it again, anointed. anointed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Everyone say power. power. Say it again, power. power. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Well, the word says here, praise God, that God anointed Jesus. So that tells us a number of things. First of all, that God and Jesus are operating in a little bit different spheres. Amen. It's how God anointed Jesus, one anointed another. God the Father, hallelujah, Jehovah, praise God. Yud Vahe, many other different names for him. God the Father anointed Jesus or Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Now, of course, that tells us something about Jesus' ministry on earth because God doesn't have to be anointed. God is the anointing. So that tells us then that Jesus operated a certain way. He operated as man on the earth, anointed by the Holy Ghost. Sure, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He is the perfect mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy tells us. Because he's man, he can represent the interests of man. But because he's God, he can represent the interests of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. But he was anointed. Now, the word anointed. The scripture talks about that the anointing is smeared on, it's poured out on you, praise God. It's rubbed on you. The anointing, praise God, consecrates you for an office or for service. In the Old Testament, only the prophet, the priest, the king, and certain people, only for a certain special ministry, experienced the anointing. The common people didn't, didn't have the anointing. They only had the anointing access to them through those varying people. Now I'll tell you what the anointing also did for you. The anointing was for distinction. It would distinguish you from somebody else when you have the anointing. The anointing is also for greatness. It, it sets you apart from the rest. And so it said Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost and he was anointed with power. The word power is dunamis in the Greek. It's inherent power. The, when you read in the scripture, that word dunamis sometimes is translated power. Sometimes it's translated mighty works, miracle working power. Sometimes it's translated ability, supernatural ability. It's translated miracles, praise God. And so Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with mighty works. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost and miracles. He's anointed with the Holy Ghost and supernatural ability and virtue. Praise God. All these things are about power who went about doing good with that and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And so the anointing was to do good with. Now turn to Acts chapter 1. Praise God. Thank God for the anointing. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1 is also a very, very normal scripture for us around here. Acts 1 8 says, But ye shall receive power. That word power is also due to this. Once again, miracle working ability, might, praise God, miracles, 
Hallelujah. Mighty words, virtue. You shall receive that. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Anybody in here a follower of Jesus? Well, Jesus says this to his followers. Praise God. Amen. And so if you are a follower of the Lord, you have been called to witness the distinguishing marks of God. You have been called to bring forth the greatness of God, and you do it by the Holy Ghost through his miracle working power. The rubbed on, poured on, smeared on, anointing the God upon you, hallelujah, is so that you can do through God what you can't do yourself. Thank God for the anointing. Now say it again, I am anointed. I am anointed. Now let's get into this. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Praise God. Thank God for the anointing. <clears throat> Genesis, the first chapter, very familiar also. Genesis 1 1 reads In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved. I underline that Spirit of God moved. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, of course, in chapter 1, it tells you God's modus operandi, how God does anything, his method of operation. I mean, you read it here in verse 3, and God said, verse 6, and God said, verse 9, and God said, verse 11, and God said, verse 14, and God said, verse 20, and God said, and verse 24, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. Amen. I mean, I mean, the, the, the proper English way to have done that would be, and God said, then list all the things he said. Praise God. But that's not the way it's written because it's telling us how God operates. Everything God does, he does it by believing it in his heart and saying it with his mouth and fully expecting it to come to pass. And the doer does it. Now, notice what it said here. Praise God. It said that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved. <clears throat> now, if you actually go back and you really research deeply this word move, this word move actually meant hovered. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. You know what to hover means. If you're a sci-fi fanatic like my son is, <laughs> Amen. He, is, he was a science tipping boy. He loved all that stuff. Amen. It was Star Trek or whatever it was. Loved science stuff. Well, you have a hovercraft that hovers sitting there over something. It said the Spirit of God hovered. Well, what's he hovering for? He's hovering, waiting on God to say. He's waiting upon God because the Holy Spirit's powerful job is to do what's said. And he's hovering on you, and he's hovering in you, and he's hovering around you. He's waiting on you to say so that he can do what you're listening to. Praise God. Well, now turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, in this story, praise God, verse 1, there's a certain man of, of Ramathim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. Verse 2 tells us Elkanah had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other one, Penina. Penina had, had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, that's a serious issue back in those da days. Because they believed if a woman didn't have children, she was cursed. In fact, a woman's entire self-esteem was wrapped up in whether or not she had kids or not. So, and, and Penina was one who took great pleasure in letting Hannah know, I got kids and you don't. Huh? In fact, if you read down to verse 6, her adversary, of course, that's Penina, also provoked Hannah sore. For the maker fret, 
because the Lord has shut up her womb. I mean, she'd give that girl the business every time she saw her. She'd get on her case. She'd laugh at her. She'd tell her, you know, I got children and you don't. And she, did it, she did it to the point that Hannah came to the place that Hannah fretted all the time and cried all the time and was upset all the time. And Penina's just having a good time giving her the business. In fact, you read verse, verse 7. And as he did so year from year, meaning their husband, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did eat. Every time they went up to the temple, every time they went to the house of God, Penina was giving the business to Hannah. And came to the place where Hannah was just so upset, she cried. Every time she came up to the temple, she started to cry. We read verse 8. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Why are you weeping? How come you stop eating? Why is it that your heart is so grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He was an excellent husband. But that wasn't what, what she was crying about. She was crying about the fact that she didn't have a child. Well, verse 9, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk, now Eli, who is now the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and Hannah was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed. Everyone say pray. pray. She prayed unto the Lord, and she wept sore. And she vowed a vow, verse 11, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me, and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Well, no razor is symptomatic of a person who was what's called a Nazarite, a person all their lives who was dedicated to the service of God purely, praise God. Well, she said, she makes this vow unto God, if you give me a child, I'm going to give the child back to you all the days of his life. I'm not going to hold on to him. Well, we read verse, verse 12, it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now, to save time, so she's there at the temple, and she's praying, and she's She's praying, the scripture said, if you keep reading later on, she's praying in her heart, but her lips are moving, but no sound's coming out. And the prophet Eli thought, you know, there's somebody here drunk at the temple, and he comes to her and says, and says you know, you need to stop drinking, you need to get your act together. And she, 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 she speaks to him, and she says, I'm not drunk. She said, I'm praying unto the Lord. Verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the Lord of Israel grant you your petition that you asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the Lord went her way and, and did eat. And her countenance was no more sad. Oh, instant change. She wouldn't eat, but she eats now. She had a sad countenance, but now that countenance is sad no more. Why? Because she prayed and then she got the word of the Lord that her prayer was answered. She believed that her mountain was moved. And when you believe that your mountain is moved, moved you stop being sad, bad man, discouraged. She started acting like, well, my prayer is answered. You know you got to act like you believe God. Amen. God's not moved by begging. And he's not moved by tears. He's moved by faith. Man, she started acting like she believed that. Glory to God. She heads on home. Praise God. And let's pick up here in verse 19. And so they rose up in the morning early, and they worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house to Ramah. And Elkanah and Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and called his name, Ask of God. That's what the word Samuel means. I mean, people name their children names that meant something. Amen? Praise God. She named him Samuel because I asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. But Hannah's not, Hannah's not going to go up. She's going to keep that child with her. She's going to wean that child. But as soon as that child is weaned, she's going to keep her vow to God. And if you've ever made a vow to God, I want to tell you something. If you ever vowed something to God, you better keep it. 
Thank you for all them amens. But if you ever made a vow to God, you better keep it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, she makes that decision. Here's read verse 26. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as I so live with my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee praying unto the Lord. This child I pray. And the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. That word lent doesn't mean like you borrow. That word lent actually in the Hebrew means I granted him to him. I gave him to him. I have granted him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord and he worship the Lord there. And so she took that boy that she asked for and she planted that boy as a seed to God Almighty. Now chapter 2 verse 1 is real important. And Hannah prayed. Hannah did what? Pray. Hannah prayed and said. Now Hannah is about to pray a prophetic prayer. You have to understand again how things work in the earth. Just some very quick review. Even though God is the creator of the world, he gave man a lease on the world. Genesis 1, 26, 1, 27, 1, 28, God made man his own image. After his own image made he them, he went on and said, in verse 28, he told that man to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. He goes on to tell that man, I, I give you dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, cattle, over all the earth. That word dominion means you rule, you reign. The eighth psalm said, what is man? You are mindful of him, the son of man that, that you visited him. Thou hast put all things into his hands and under his feet in the eighth psalm. Amen. In other words, you understand how a lease works. If you lease a house, amen, let's say you have a three-year lease. Well, the house isn't yours. It doesn't belong to you, but during the time of that lease, it does. In the time of that lease, that house is yours and you are responsible for that house. Are you listening to me? And the owner of the house cannot just walk into your house without your permission, even though he's the owner. But during the terms of that lease, it is yours. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, that's what God's done with us. There is an earth lease. And even though the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and the world and all that dwell therein, Man has been given dominion of it. Now we're near the end of that lease. And so, well, then how does God do anything in the earth? He does it by getting someone who has the rightful authority in the earth, the lessee, men in the earth, who are willing to allow God's word to be spoken through their mouths of their own volition, who would yield themselves to the Spirit of God to speak the word. When they did so, Isaiah 55 comes in the big. Isaiah 55 says, my word is like rain that falls from heaven, God said. It goes into the earth, it waters the earth, it brings forth and bud. It will bring food, it, it, it will bring forth food to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return void. It will accomplish that which I said it to do. See, once the word is put in the earth, Satan can't dig it up and throw it out of the earth. And once that word has been spoken out of the mouth of a man, it's going to come to pass. So if you can get a man of God or a woman of God to speak what God says, and that's what this woman's now about to do. She prays a prophetic prayer out of her mouth. She is going to prophesy future events. Hannah prayed and said, My heart, verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Praise God. We'll read down to verse 5. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. They that were hungry cease, so that the barren have born seven. Now I'd underline that barren have born seven. Because Hannah was the barren. Hello, somebody. Hannah was the barren. And she that hath many children is wax feeble. Well, we'll read down again to save time. Verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. She's prophesying about a future king that is come that is called the anointed one. 
Hallelujah. We know who that king is. He's going to be the king of kings. And he's going to be the anointed one. We call him Jesus. He's called in the Hebrew Yeshua HaMessiah. He is Jesus, the one that is anointed. Amen. Well, God is going to bless him. If you read the verse 18, the same chapter. Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girdled for linen ephah. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for, or why, this loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Well, amen. She's going to have, she's going to have five additional children besides Samuel. She's got six. But the scripture said, but the barren woman's going to bear seven. Well, what's the seventh child? The one that she prays for. She prays, and the word out of her mouth is going to be part of her and many others who bring about the seventh child, the Messiah. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, hallelujah. She's the first one to identify who, who he is, and the seventh child is born out of her prayer. Glory to God. And notice what God says about it. God says through Samuel, it's because of the loan of your first child to the Lord that you get to have the other six. Her seed to God brought her a harvest. And don't you ever forget, if you, you need harvest, seed planted is how you get it. Thank you, Jesus. So coming through her is going to be the anointed one. Now turn to Isaiah 42. Praise God. Say, I am anointed. Say it again, I am anointed. Praise God. If God has ever selected you to do anything, anything God calls, any assignment God ever gives it, anyone, an anointing comes with it. That anointing has in it power. It has in it mighty works. It has in it abilities that are beyond what you can do. So the question is, if you're obeying God, not what your limitations are. The question is, are you willing to yield to the anointing that's on you? Praise God, isn't the word good? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to make sure that you know him and that you find him in your life today. All you have to do is pray with me right now. That's right. Bow your heads. Pray with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I do believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me on the cross, is risen from the dead, and is the Lord and Savior. And that's all it takes. Right now, he's coming to your heart, and he saved you now. We want to give you some material that will help you with your new walk with Christ. It's called, Where Do We Go From Here? And our announcers, I'll tell you more about it in the name of Jesus. The Word of God entered your spirit as you just received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, the real you. Your spirit was born again. That means that you're now a new creation in Christ, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This process started an immediate change in your mind and body. However, to continue this process of change, you must put away your old habits and learn how to walk in your new life with God by starting your day with the Father in prayer. Just a simple prayer of praise and thanksgiving helps to build your fellowship with God. Thank Him for His love, confidence, patience, loving kindness, peace, healing power, safety from all dangers, mercy, wisdom, and guidance for this day. Be sure to take the time to read the Word of God daily. Just like your natural body needs food, your spirit man needs to be fed the Word of God. 
Also, please write to the address on your screen so we can send you this very important booklet called Where Do I Go From Here? It contains a wealth of information that you will need now that you've decided to ask the Lord into your heart and continue your walk with God. Finally, it's important that you also take the time to find a church home and have fellowship with other full-time gospel believers. Our prayer for you is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Well, this is Keith Butler reminding you to have a wonderful day and always remember to fight the good fight of faith.